Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. I wanted to stimulate an intergenerational conversation about women's lives, where we've got to and what still needs to be done. Because funnily enough, I think that's really lacking in feminism and in public life. People tend to belong to one generation or another. You know, now the second wave feminists who are sort of a decade older than me, they seem to be rather entrenched in, in their world or I mean, I'm, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to anyone, but it seems like that sometimes. And then there's the younger wave. There's fourth wave feminism of women slightly younger than Stella who are coming along. And I think we all ought to talk together. I'm quite interested, maybe we can discuss this in a bit. There was second wave feminism, which is now a historical movement. We're now in fourth wave feminism. I've been trying to find out when third wave feminism hit and whether was I on holiday at the time or something. And I did put a question on Twitter about it and I got some quite interesting answers. But some people said it was the 80s, some people said it was the, the 90s. Just one other thing about going around and talking to people. It's amazing the hunger out there, not just among different generations of women, but among mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. They just want to talk out the issues. I've got two daughters, one 19, one 17. So I've spent the best part of two decades thinking about young women's lives. And I realized that I just can't quite work out what they face as a a generation. I couldn't really see what was ahead. And also I had a sense of unease about their lives, which I couldn't make sense of. On the one hand, I noticed that there was this extraordinary narrative of competence and confidence. I mean, 95 years ago, the women in this room, none of us could have voted, which I think is, is just an amazingly short time ago. There has been in the decades since an explosion in women's educational, work and sexual possibilities, and these are all real gains. And our media are filled with tales of exceptional female achievement. And yet there is this distinct unease in and around women's experience. And for many parents of daughters, the question resolves itself in this way. Why, if confidence is there for young women to claim, which we're often told, why does there seem to be a crisis of confidence among so many young women? Now, in one sense, there's no great mystery about it. We still have a dearth of women in public life. We tend to hear more about them because women make good copy and pioneers. Where our, our media is very interested in pioneers. And some people, like the IPPR, have just talked about the women pioneers in every field as a kind of decoy generation that distract us from the fact that so many other women are not achieving. But it's right that there are, there are not as many women as men in most fields. But there's also real pressures on young women today. First of all, it's extraordinary pornification of popular culture. I don't know if any of you have watched Rihanna's l latest video. It employs all the codes of what would have been top shelf pornography when I was a, a teenager. And in fact, it made me go back and look at Madonna's video like a virgin which when i was well in my 20s was seen as the sort of shocking video of its time it was so demure there was madonna there was madonna in a gondola a bit of thrusting you know we always look to madonna to thrust but compared to the rihanna video and compared to miley cyrus and her foam fingers and her twerking and all the rest of it this is an entirely new world and then there's what i call pinkification which is the return to nature rather than nurture-based ideas of femaleness, which are limiting girls once again. And again, this intergenerational approach is really interesting. I talked to grandmothers who were passionate feminists in the 1970s, and they said, I raise my children, who are now middle-aged mothers, to, you know, in a non-sexist way. You can't use the term non-sexist now because the Daily Mail will come down on you like a ton of bricks. But that was how it used to be discussed. And now she says, one grandmother said, when I take my granddaughter into shops, I'm horrified at how pink and girly and limiting the whole thing is. So I think that's another real feature of our, of our culture. Now, I welcome without reservation the lifting of a veil of silence and shame that's blighted the lives of earlier generations. I talked to women who are only 10 years older than me who said having sex out of marriage was a shame, 
abortions, backstreet abortions, all that history that we need to remember. But when I look at young women today, my daughter's generation, they seem caught between a values-free marketization of sex, play the field, Hannah Rosen's term, hearts of steel, and then a neo-traditionalism that is always urging them to abstinence, to celibacy, and to a new kind of traditionalism. So what I would tell our daughters is the way out of this impasse is only through an emotional literacy. It is for each of you, I would say to young women, to honour both the relational sides of yourself and the sexual sides of yourself and to give up on neither. And there's a very interesting book by an American psychotherapist called Leslie Bell called Hard to Get about the paradox of 20-something women. And she says exactly this, that the young women who negotiate this minefield the best are the ones who can honour their needs for real connection and their sexual desires. And she says, which interests me even more, those who are allowed to be most authentically themselves in their childhood were the ones who found that the easiest to do. All of those are themes that we identify with. And I think there's also a really important point of saying about the different generations of feminists. I guess that makes me an in-betweener feminist um, because I take for granted, and I think my generation of feminists took for granted that the gains that our mothers and our fathers have made towards the road to equality would be inevitable, that somehow there'd be this rolling world of a better, more progressive world coming our way. Uh, I mean, and I say that as somebody who grew up in a household with lots of women's press books, with a very strong mother, a very strong father, equally determined and committed, that women were equal. Um, so some of the things I now reflect on as a parliamentarian, as a woman in her sort of late 30s in modern British society, indeed modern culture, are deeply frightening to me because there are some debates I just thought we'd put to bed. Um, that one of my colleagues can have questions about poor sexual etiquette, that other colleagues in other parts of the world can talk about legitimate rape really frightens me and I think what's so powerful about your book is that recognition that there has been progress and yet progress is not inevitable therefore unless we have answers to some of the new debates that we're facing as well as some of the old debates we will go backwards not forwards. But why do you think it is that a younger group of women has now made up what we call fourth wave feminism why wasn't it your generation why is it that these women in their 20s well, I'm curious, I, yeah, I think it, I mean, I think there was a complacency about politics and a complacency about social and economic change full stop in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. And that's why I find it incredibly inspiring. And, you know, when I, when I looked at the title of your book and I think, well, you know, what should we tell our mums? Well, first and foremost, the future is really, really bright because there is this resurgence of very, very dynamic, very, very polemic uh, feminism. And I really welcome that because, yeah. frankly, it's a kick up the arse to my generation of what have we been doing for the last 10 to 15 years. And it's a call to your generation to say to us, help us learn, help us get this right. I saw Harriet Harman speak at the Labour Party Women's Conference. We were both there. And I think it was the biggest political meeting, Harriet Harman said, of women that there'd ever been. It was 1,200 women in a room. And um, she said at the end of the session that there is a generation of women, which is my generation, sort of mid-50s through to the 60s, who were pioneers in their way and that they went into work and went into politics and uh, they're still active and there and I, I, mean, I suppose I absolutely represent that and that's new isn't it because my mother's generation well they 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 were different they went into maybe more voluntary work or they, and they weren't in the workforce and in public life in quite the same way so we are at a new moment that is quite hopeful actually I still wonder if there's sort of intergenerational mistrust between women. I, I don't like to think it. I like to think there's a nice, open, friendly political field. But what do you think? One of the most frightening questions I've ever dealt with was a young woman within my political party who, when she found out that I got selected in the all-women shortlist, said, yeah, but I want to be selected on merit. And I said, well, good luck with that, love. <laughs> And it made me realise that the debates and discourses that I grew up listening to my mum, listening to other people within broader progressive movements about, we just didn't have time to deal with the kind of asking nicely to end discrimination, that we had to act in these ways. The debates, yeah. in fact, you know, one of the most powerful things for me was watching John Prescott arguing for all of his shortlists, had somehow been forgotten, that somehow there was a presumption that equality was there. And I think there is a real need for us to learn from previous generations about, you know, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, that is inequality coming. And there is also a need for us to be able to say, here are some of the new changes that we're dealing with. Absolutely, pay inequality still exists. I mean, mm. how on earth have we gone through 30, 40 years 
of feminism being a mainstream discourse and we still have pay inequality. But yes, we also have to deal with some of those cultural debates. What is the most frightening thing to me? We're all talking about Miley Cyrus. I got asked in an interview about Miley Cyrus today. I said, what about Robin Thicke? He was mm. the man yeah. standing with this young girl, doing that, encouraging it. Nobody has held him up to the yeah. same sense yeah. here. Where is Jay-Z, who when he had a daughter said, you know what? I've got to stop using the phrase ho. And you're like, yeah, you're married yeah. to Beyonce, sorry. Yeah. You know? Where is the, the letter from him to Robin Thicke saying, hang on a minute, blood. This isn't the kind of society I want to bring up my daughter mm. in. Where is the learning that cuts across generations from that side of the debate as well? One of the things that was, I came out from having written my book feeling most strongly about is how girls disappear during adolescence, that they might be very, very confident up to about nine or ten, and lots of teachers would say this. And then, you know, there's hormonal changes, and of course they're preparing to separate from the parents and make their individual life. But I think we really fail as a society both to validate their emotions, but at this point I'm thinking about help them to talk about current affairs, talk about what they're thinking, and that we need to do completely different things in schools to encourage much more speaking and listening and debate, not in a rhetorical Oxford Union way, mm. but in a much more daily way so that girls get used to speaking their mind and also dealing with criticism, because what strikes me about a lot of women of my generation is that the habit of not speaking gets very, very ingrained. So to a lot of women that I know, you would seem a frighteningly confident creature, which of course you ask them. But um, women, I think, get very alarmed by being criticised. But you know, one of the things that people have often said to me is nobody likes a clever woman. Um, <laughs> Well, I do. I quite like clever women. I think, I think people they're quite, quite like clever women. I also actually. think there is an issue here again about how do we have this debate, um, not just amongst women. Uh, there's a really fascinating study that shows that in a room, if 20% of the audience is female, men think it's 50%. And some of this, look, we can do everything we can. I'm involved in various mentoring projects with young women, absolutely, and challenging, in admitting, I don't feel confident. I constantly worry about uh, what I'm going to say. I constantly worry about whether I've got things right. I constantly have that moment where you go, you know, yeah. because you're ingrained, because it's, it's part of your culture. Um, you know, what was the best lesson my mum taught? My mum was an amazing, amazing woman who was a head teacher of a special school dealing with emotional difficulties in boys. So she really had that ability, to, although she says the two, women, two children she couldn't control were me and my brother. But she <laughs> taught me to approach every situation as though I was wearing a metaphorical top hat and high heels. So to walk in, so even if you feel frightened, go into the room. What was be it? part of it? Yeah. Feel that you are as tall and as able as everybody else. And that worked most of the time. Yeah. yeah. Um, but and look, we can do all that we can to encourage that and encourage people to have that diversity of experience and to be able to be vulnerable and be able to say, you know what, I'm not sure. What was the best learning experience for me walking into Parliament, going into the chamber and watching other MPs who I'd seen on TV who were great heroes to me be nervous about speaking mm. and thinking, oh, it's okay to find this frightening. Yeah. That's only 50% of the story. We do also have to change the culture, the language, the expectation of the other people in the room with us, both generationally and in gender terms. Because actually, if as a woman, when you speak and you speak as much as men and then you are called strident and difficult and there is a, an attempt to control you, then however confident you are, that is always going to be a battle. However competent you are, you are always going to be discriminated against. So some of that is about good old fashioned sexism and misogyny that we also have to tackle. It takes different forms in a society where people think we have equality. You know, my father's generation is much more alive to my father is much more alive to people judging me on my gender than my partner is or my brother is. Not because my partner or my brother wouldn't consider themselves feminists, but because they've grown up in an environment yeah, where they expect yeah. equality. And I think that's the thing coming out of the in between a generation. We expect equality was going to happen. And therefore you'd maybe don't notice where it's creeping in. That's what you're saying, that your generation, the men in it might not, because they thought it was there, they may not realise when it isn't there, which your father yeah. will realise. Well, and um, you know, if we're talking about inequalities in power, somebody has to give power up to have a more equal society. So the idea that this isn't going to be a battle, I think, is the thing that we have to learn from our, from the younger generation of feminists who've seen that battle and gone, sorry, you're accepting this? What the hell? If you make this just about women, actually you are reifying that existing inequality in society because you're saying it's enough to tick a box and say there's a woman here. That's how you end up with a prime minister who says, it's all right, ladies, I've appointed one woman to advise me on women. There we go, job done. But it is interesting the way that both Ed Miliband and David Cameron have recently shaken up their 
front benches as we go into the election with many, many more women in it. Yeah, but I am the first person to say that that isn't the end of the story. That's the start of a conversation about what are we missing. It's the start of a conversation about the interaction. And I think one of the things that my generation has to bring to this conversation is a recognition that if we argued that feminism was about women, if we argued that it was about the strides that we can make, whether through women's shortlists or making sure you had women in the room, we were missing a trick in making out that actually it's the interaction between men and women that makes the difference, that actually we offer something to them and in debating and discussing with men as equals, they offer something to us. It's when you have that inequality in the room that actually being in the room doesn't make the difference. I thought the most interesting thing and the worrying thing that came up was what kind of a society have we made if talented young women and men feel that they cannot reproduce because it will get in the way of their success. That is a real, real problem. And it's a problem that really Ed Miliband, who is a talented young man who's managed to reproduce, um, should be addressing on behalf of everybody else. Because it really means thinking about all the things you've pointed out, the power imbalance, who loses out. I mean, the truth is, it is mainly going to be women still who lose out. And men who decide to lose out pay quite a high price for it. I mean, I live with somebody and subsequently married, someone who actually didn't ever do full-time work so he could genuinely share in the, in the upbringing of our children. That gave me an enormous advantage. He also did the shopping, the cooking, and all the things that usually are assigned to women just because they can bear children, which I've never understood the, the, the logical connection between the ability to have a baby and then the fact that you then run everything else. Um, I really don't. So I think that is a, that's an old feminist question that is still so relevant. So Stella, I think you should be pressing that. I see that absolutely as a challenge of parenting. And I think my generation of feminists have to look harder at the men in our lives and the partners in our lives to say, this ain't a solo endeavour, sunshine. This is about both of us. And to be able to have the confidence to do that, because your family are probably the strongest motivator for the choices that you can make and the opportunities that you can have. Uh, in that sense, um, I think we should all thank Melissa, but I think we should also be asking her, what should we tell our sons? Because actually, this is only 50% of the conversation.